Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. The title of this series is straight from Scripture. It's found in Romans chapter 8. Look at it with me today. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now if you were to count in just those verses, there are 17 different things that the Apostle Paul, the writer of that scripture, say threaten to take away our hope, threaten to separate us from the love of God. Another place in scripture he does this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. However, there he makes it much more personal. He says the things that he's gone through that have threatened uh, to make him hopeless, threatened to despair, threatened to separate him from the love of God. Uh, he says that I've been shipwrecked multiple times. I've been beaten with rods and stones and I've been starving. I've been abandoned by friends. I've been homeless. I've been accused of things I never did. I've been imprisoned unjustly. I've been unable to sleep. I've been left in the cold. On top of all that, I have the daily burden of my ministry in these churches. And he says, still nothing is able to separate me from the love of God that I found in Christ Jesus. So let's make it personal for you today. Let's just make this very personal. There's a list in the middle of your outline, if you haven't looked at that yet, that lists six things, not 17 things, but about six things that can lead us at times to feel hopeless and helpless and overcome by circumstances. And if you've, let's just walk through them, and if you've ever experienced uh, one of these, just put a check mark by it, or at least just a mental check mark that says, yep, that's me, I, I've been through that, or I'm going through that right now. First one is a traumatic event. By that I mean something that's happened to you, uh, maybe when you were a child, maybe you experienced abuse in your home, or maybe you saw physical violence in your home, or you were the recipient of violence, maybe you witnessed a traumatic event in your community, maybe you've survived a natural disaster. Um, if you've experienced a traumatic event, just make a little check by that. A second category of things that can cause us over time to maybe lose hope or strained relationships Relationships with your family or a marriage relationship, a really close friendship that goes through terrible, terrible conflict and it's disruptive. The next one is a serious health problem. If you've ever had a serious diagnosis or you've been diagnosed with cancer, as many people in our church have, if you've had a health condition that's just taking you to the brink, it's taking you to the limit, it's taking you farther than you've ever thought you'd be in, in your suffering and your struggle. A crushing disappointment. It could be a category that you've experienced. Uh, things that you've planned for your whole life. Maybe even since you were a little kid, you knew what career you wanted. Maybe uh, you dreamed of this career and it didn't happen or it hasn't happened yet and you haven't gotten the opportunities that you wish uh, that you'd have. And maybe you thought you were going to be a college athlete and you were preparing for something um, but then got injured or for whatever reason the opportunities you've been hoping for, the things that, that you've dreamed of that you wish would happen didn't happen or hasn't happened yet, you might check off crushing disappointment. An unchangeable circumstance. This could be a mental illness. It could be that you were in an accident. It could be that you've suffered uh, the loss of the use of a limb or the loss of limb. Maybe you've had a stroke and it's left your body with it not working the way it used to work. Maybe you're the caregiver of a child who has a serious physical illness and it's unchangeable. And sometimes in those places of unchangeable circumstances, we can become overwhelmed and lose our hope. And then lastly, painful loss. If you've ever lost a child or a sibling or 
a close family member, someone dear to you. It can be a deep, te- a deep, deep pain where you wonder if you could ever really be happy again. And those kinds of losses can take you to the ground. So maybe there's some people in here where you, you checked off several of those things. Maybe uh, you're married and, and you'd say, man, between the two of us, we could check off all of these things. Or maybe you've just checked off one. You know, I'd, I'd find it hard to believe that, um, that there's someone that hasn't at least experienced a strained relationship that's caused some heartache or at least one of these things. But here's what I, where I'm getting at with this. Why is it that some people will face these things and be tanked by them and others will rise again? Why is it some are devastated by these things and some rise again and they're still standing? What makes the difference? Well, study after study after study has shown that the people who survive and not only survive but thrive in the face of of trauma are not necessarily the people that we might think. It's not the wealthiest. It's not the most affluent. It's not the most intelligent. It's not the highly educated. It's not the people of any specific gender or race. It has everything to do with how perseverant and how resilient you are. How perseverant and resilient you are, like on the inside your spirit. And these perseverant, resilient people are the people who can rise from the ashes. They are the people who are still standing no matter what has happened. They're the people that I would call the Lego people in life. So you're going to go Christmas shopping, toy shopping this season, and there's like two different types of toys. There's the toys that make it 10 minutes outside of the box. They're not very resilient. And there's the Legos. And the Legos... Like the thing that you build may come apart, but the Lego itself, it's, not, it's resilient. Like it's the most resilient thing on the planet because if you've ever put your foot or a knee on a Lego, you know that you cannot kill the Lego. The Lego will kill you. <laughs> like after a nuclear disaster, it's just going to be cockroaches and Legos that survive. Like they cannot be taken down. They're the most resilient things. How do you become resilient? Scientists look at this this and say, well, is perseverance and resilience, is it genetic? And the truth is what they've concluded is that resilience and perseverance are a set of skills that can be learned. Hello? Come on, that's good news. That's good news. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, that means that the rest of us can learn perseverance, and I want to learn it because I want to bounce back. I don't want to be buried by the losses in life. I want to not only survive, I want to thrive. I want to live a hope-infused life, not a hopeless life. Our church has so many resilient people, people with such deep perseverance and character, people who have seen a lot, but they're still standing. You are probably one of those people. And the fact that you're in church today, you're here today, proves that you're probably one of these people. And you've seen this verse come true in your life, Romans 5, 3. We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. So there's this process that we go through, and many of us have gone through it. It's, in with, it's within reach of every one of us to go through hard times, to go through suffering, develop perseverance that produces character, that produces hope, and see suffering actually produce hope. You see, the, the most hope-infused people are not the people who haven't gone through anything. So the people that are going to come to church this weekend and... and, and they don't have any check marks. They haven't experienced anything like that. They're not the ones with the most hope. The ones with the most hope are the people who have seen some stuff. They've lived some stuff. They've gone through some suffering. And because of that, it's produced perseverance, and that's produced character, and that's produced hope. Those are the hope-infused people. And the most hope-infused people are the ones who are willing to let this process work in their life. So I just want to talk about this process. I want to give you three things today that, that are going to get this process working. Three things about perseverance, about resilience, about endurance, about building character. 
that I think are going to help you in whatever you're facing uh, today. The first one, this is not good news, but it's that life is harder than we ever expected. We forget this. We have somehow got it in our brains that life is supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be comfortable. It's supposed to be stress-free. We're like, we're out there looking for a stress-free life. It does not exist. It's not there. And we think that everything is supposed to come without pain. And we have these amazingly high expectations of what life is supposed to look like. And then when the wheels fall off the bus or the carpet's pulled out from underneath us or we slip on the banana peel and fall on our face, we're shocked. Shocked. And from that shocked place, we become angry. And from that angry place, we have disillusionment and confusion as though life was supposed to be easy and that life was supposed to be painless. And when it's not, we don't know what to do. And we say things like, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to us? Jesus says in John 16, 33, he says, guys, in this world, you will have trouble. He doesn't say some people are going to fall on hard times and some are not. No, everyone's going to have problems. And some people find life so hard and so overwhelming and so debilitating that they end up taking their, their life. Almost a million people around the world this year are going to take their own life. 44,000 in the United States. It's the number two cause of death between people in in ages 10 to 34 in the United States. The number two cause of death. And people who die when they take their own lives, they're not wanting to die. They don't want to die. It's just because they're experiencing so much pain and so much hardship that they see no other way out. They see no other way for the pain to stop. The Bible is so real about this too. Job uh, is this man who's lost his family, his home, his crops, his livelihood. He's going through physical pain. He's covered in boils from head to toe. And he just talks about getting to that place where he doesn't even want to live anymore. Job 17 says, My days have passed. My plans have failed. My hope is gone. But my friends say night is daylight. They say that light is near. But I know I remain in darkness. My only hope is the world of the dead where I will lie down to sleep in the dark. This is a man in despair. And you know what? Job was wrong. Job was wrong. That wasn't his only hope. And the way to rebuild hope in your life is to just come to this place to accept that life is harder than you ever thought it was going to be. We get disillusioned by this. We're over here doing a a sermon series on how to pay off uh, this nice car that we have when there's people in the world who are wondering how many years they're going to have to be an indentured servant to pay off a $10 loan. We have forgotten that life is harder than we ever expected. And again, this isn't the, the, good, the good news. This is just a platform that we have to start from, that we can't be freaked out when things aren't as easy or as simple or as uncomplicated as we thought they were going to be. We have to anticipate change. Change for the positive and for the negative should never come as a surprise to a human being. Change is going to happen for the positive and the negative in our life. And when we start from this platform, the life is harder than I even ever expected it was going to be. We're on our way towards perseverance and resilience because we've got to start with the right expectation. Now here's the good news. God gives us resources to cope with life. Number two, God gives us resources to cope with life. God is so good that he gives us resources to be able to cope with the fact that life is harder than we ever thought it was going to be. And he gives us three things. And you can just write these things. I'll give you three verses and you can write what those things are on, on that line above that verse I've given you. He says he gives a savior. A savior. Because what we need more than anything else is you and I need a savior. Jesus said in John 16, 33, so this is this verse again, but the whole thing. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, be encouraged. You don't have to overcome the world. You don't have to solve every problem. You don't have to carry the weight of the world. You can't. 
But someone can and someone has and he has carried the weight of the world and his name is Jesus. What's so great about that? Well, it's, it's, what's so great about it is you don't have to fix the gap between you and God. It, it's not another stress. It's not another to-do list. It's not another thing you have to take on to now be good enough to get to God. Jesus says, I've come that you might have rest from that. That there is someone, his name is Jesus, who was powerful enough to do the work for us to be connected to God again. And once we acknowledge that we need that Savior, once we acknowledge that Jesus' resurrection is what broke the chains of sin that kept us out of a relationship with God, he becomes, yes, our guide, yes, our mentor, but he becomes our Savior. Because what you Life is harder than you ever expected. And Jesus says, I'm not going to come and then give you a system or give you another thing to do. I'm going to solve your greatest problem. And I'm going to give you the good news that you can be connected to God again. Another thing that God has given us to cope with life is he's given us a new mind. A new mind and a new heart that aligns with his. We can begin to think like God and feel like God. Over time, we can develop and transform So Romans chapter 8, this is in verse 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So before we lean on Jesus for salvation, before we are in Christ, our minds are in a scary place. They really are. Because the Bible says that our minds and our will were controlled by sin. Controlled by sin and by Satan. And I realize that that sounds a little scary, but the Bible says that we were part of Satan's domain and we were controlled by him before we were even aware of it. Now, I'm saying that if you're not, a, I'm not saying that if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, that you're evil, wicked, mean, and nasty, and you qualify for an episode of The Walking Dead, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But you don't have the mind of Christ yet. And your mind is being controlled by sin. And what is so amazing about this is that the Bible says that the longer we are in relationship with Christ, the more he can transform and renew our minds. And some of the thought patterns that have tripped us up our whole life can over time begin to alter and change the way we act and react. The third thing that God has given us to help with, to cope with life's difficulties is he's given us his word, God's word. He's given us a roadmap, and it's far better than iMaps or Google Maps or Waze. Psalm 119, 105 says, By your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. And truthfully, the the path in front of us in life can be so dark. It can be as dark as Carlsbad Cavern. And you need a light. And the Bible says that it is our light to our path. It throws a beam of light on our path where you can see where others cannot And others will say, how can you be so resilient? How can you be so perseverant? And he says, because I've got a beam of light you don't have. I've got something you don't have, but you can have it. It's God's word, and it's throwing a beam of light on my path. So when you read the Bible, when you study the Bible, when you memorize the Bible, when you meditate on the Bible, when you actually put the biblical principles in practice in your life, over time, you are more persevering. You have more character, and you become hope-infused. And you are transformed. This is why I highlight verses in my Bible. This is why I write them out on cards, and I put them in my car and at my desk and in my nightstand and I put them in notes on my phone because when the darkness comes even pastors can't remember where everything is in the Bible and in those moments I don't need my own thoughts in those moments I don't need words from from man or from a person I don't need a tweet I don't need something on a coffee cup I need the word of God I need the power of scripture And it helps us cope with life and helps us renew our mind. Third thing that I want to talk about today is that in the face of that despair, we get to choose our responses in life. I get to choose my responses in life. You get to choose your responses in life. So those, those check marks that you made on your outline, you probably didn't have a lot of control over those things. 
But you and I get to choose our responses to those things. You and I get to choose. This is freedom. This is liberation to know that I'm not held captive to a disease or a disappointment or disillusionment or depression or even death. I'm not held captive to those things and neither are you. And that's just a a thought that you've got to sit with for a little while. That you are not held captive to what has happened to you. You are free. You're not even held captive to the things that you did choose. The sins that you committed, the things that you did have a choice over, the things you have done wrong, you can still choose how you respond today. This is freedom. This is liberation. You get to choose your response. Now, it wouldn't be right to to tell you this today and not point you in the direction of some choices that you can make. You say, I'm free to choose. What am I free to choose? Well, here's so just let's walk through quickly some practical choices we can make to give us hope again, to help us build perseverance and build character and build hope and find hope again. The first one is choose to expand your connections. So when hope starts to fade and we start going through those really hard moments, there's a natural tendency in all of us to withdraw. And that's the moment we want to isolate and we want to unplug. It's the moment we want to disengage, the moment we want to pull back away from family and from friends and from church and from our small group and from our sponsor and from the people who love us and care about us. We want to pull back away from the activities. We want to pull back away from the the small group leaders in our life and the people who love us and care for us. And when despair starts to build, the natural tendency is to pull back and we must choose in that moment to press in. To press into the community around us. We must choose in those moments to press into the relationships to the people who are there for you, who love you, who care about you. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend is always a friend. And relatives are born to share our troubles. Now, some of you would like to instantly rewrite that verse too, and relatives are born to cause our troubles. <laughs> and there's some truth there. There is. But this is talking best case scenario. And you know what this is? This is actually instruction to those who are the friends, who are the relatives. This is instruction to you. Life is hard enough for everybody without friends and relatives piling on. Life is hard. You've got to watch your words. You've got to watch how you respond. Share the trouble. Take some of the burden off. Share the burden. Now, I'm not saying that when I say expand your connections, that in the midst of trouble and pain, that you've got to become the party person and the life of the party and tell anyone and everyone what you're going through. No, that's probably not the best choice either. But you got to have a small group of people. And maybe, maybe it's just at least one person in that small group that you can reach out to. Just choose not to isolate. Do not isolate. Next, choose to believe that you are capable and God's strength of handling anything. Pastor Kelly talked about this last week in that powerful message. He said, because I am in Christ, I can take off the label of unqualified. I can take off the label of weak, and I can take on the label of capable. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ uh, who gives me strength. I used to think that was just a bumper sticker verse, a coffee cup verse, a tattoo verse, you know? But I'm learning why the most popular verses in the Bible are the most popular verses in the Bible. Because we need them. And because apart from Christ, I'm not capable of handling anything. But in Christ, I can handle anything. In Christ, you can handle anything. Anything that's going to come your way. In Christ, I can handle anything. Not as some lone ranger, but through Christ and with his people, I can handle anything. The third, third choice, third one down, choose to avoid expecting the worst. You know, this is called catastrophizing, and this is where you take a simple event in your life and you take it to the worst possible outcome. Like this, I have a headache. I must have a brain tumor. My car is making a funny noise. I must need a new car. My boss wants to meet with me. I'm getting fired. I know it. They didn't invite me. I must have done something wrong. I must have offended them. 
And when, when you've already written those scenarios and you've already written that bad scene in your head, you've got to pull out Psalm 94, 19. Let's read it out loud together. Lord, when doubts fill my mind, when my heart is in turmoil, quiet me and give me renewed hope and cheer. I don't know how many times I've pulled out that verse and just said, God, quiet me. Quiet me and renew my hope. And that's a verse that might need to go in a nightstand or in a hope box or in a tackle box or in a glove box. The next choice, choose to protect your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. Everything you do flows from it. Persevering people have, under, have come to understand that wave after wave after wave of hardship can warp your perspective. And so they've learned how to practice taking care of themselves in the middle of hard times. They're careful about their inner life. They know that, that wave after wave of hardship can warp your perspective of the world. It can warp your perspective of people. It can cause you not to trust people. And they take care of their inner life. They protect their heart. You know, every, every time I have preached on stress or anxiety or depression or messages like this, someone will come up to me afterwards and they'll say, Ryland, you're, you're just talking about the stress we all deal with. You're just talking about um, the trauma or the life experiences that we all deal with. Mine's different. This won't work for what I've experienced. And yes, it's true. What you've experienced is very severe. And what you've experienced is probably unique. But if your response, if your choice is to exempt yourself from the things that we all should be doing, that we just know human beings have to do to protect our heart and care for ourselves, you are then choosing to exempt yourself from the blessings and the benefits that come from those things. You get to choose how you respond. And if you choose to exempt yourself from what Scripture teaches, if you choose to exempt yourself from just, just even the nuts and bolts things that we all have to do, like getting rest, like eating well, like drinking water, like getting outside, I mean, just some of those things, you rob yourself from the blessings of those things. Do not choose to exempt yourself from what Scripture teaches. Do not choose to exempt yourself from following what God is leading you to do. Ephesians 4.27 gives us another angle on this. He says, do not give the devil a foothold. What does that mean? It's talking about your inner life. It's like the Marines establishing a beachhead on an island. In World War II, after the Japanese took over the whole South Pacific, the, the United States Marines would go in and go out and they would start taking back islands. And what they would do is they would uh, land on an island and they would establish what's called a beachhead. And it wouldn't be very big. It'd be like 10 yards deep, 200 yards wide. But it would allow them to not fight from the boats anymore, but to fight on the land to get on the island. And you know what's amazing? Is once the Marines took a beachhead, they never lost an island. Not once. Yes, there were some battles that were lost here and there, but ultimately, uh, ultimate victory was theirs. Every time. Every time. And spiritually, this is what happens when the devil establishes a foothold or a beachhead in your life. He doesn't try to take over your whole life at once. He starts by getting one little area. He starts by getting one compartment of my life. Everything else in my life's good. Everything's great. It's just this one thing over here I don't tell anyone about. It's just this one thing over here that I won't admit and confess is a sin. It's just this one thing over here that I'm hanging on to from my past. Now, do you think Satan is going to be satisfied with just a beachhead in your life? No. He wants to take it over. He wants to ruin you. What's the most common foothold that Satan gets in our life? The answer is any negative emotion. Any negative emotion Satan can use as a foothold, as a, as a beachhead in your life. Jealousy can give Satan a foothold in, in your life. Envy 
can give Satan a foothold. I wonder how much they make. It's a foothold in your life. Fear can be a foothold. Resentment can be a foothold. Lust can be a foothold. Anger can be a foothold. Boredom can be a foothold. And when you mix several of these heart conditions together, they're very potent. For instance, when you're tired and you're fatigued and you're frustrated and you're hurt and you're lonely, that combination right there is setting you up amazingly for Satan to gain more ground in your life. Because what happens is you start feeling bad and that little voice starts to say, you deserve a little comfort. You deserve a release. You deserve a little pressure. You deserve a little fun. And you start listening to yourself and you know where that voice is coming from. And you know their ideas you would never otherwise consider if things were going good. And that's why you've got to protect your heart and you've got to protect the condition of your heart. And you've got to continually go to Jesus. He says, I want you to really live. And I have real life for you. Another choice that can help you rebuild hope is choose to discover a truth about yourself. Understand that in the middle of this mess, in the middle of the difficulties that you're experiencing, it's like, there's likely some things about yourself that are hidden in this mess uh, that would be really important for you to discover and learn about yourself. You know, one of the benefits of trouble is it exposes where we are weaker than we thought where we're weaker than we thought we were. It exposes the holes and the gaps in our faith. You know, there have been times in my life and in Lauren and I's marriage and family and, and just walking through uh, pain and, and things with people in the church where I was just thought, I thought my faith was stronger than this. And that trouble, even though I wasn't choosing that trouble, it was exposing where my faith needed to be fortified. It was exposing where I needed to grow in my faith. Even in conflict, as uncomfortable as conflict can be with the people that we love, if you are a resilient person, if you are a perseverant person, if you're a person of character, you're not going to be afraid to say, I know I didn't choose this, but is there some way I handle conflict that I could grow in? A resilient person is not afraid to say, how could I get better from this? How could I learn from this? I know what the other person has said, but is there something about me here that I need to take a look at? And trouble has a way of helping us if, if we will let it. Lamentations 3.30 is just this funny little verse in the Bible. It says we can also learn from insults and hard knocks. We can choose to learn and, and get better from it. The next choice is to practice gratitude. Choose to practice gratitude. If you're going to be uh, someone who turns suffering into hope, you're going to have to practice gratitude. Not necessarily thankful for the wound itself or the disappointment or the loss of suffering. That, that, that's very hard to find gratitude in. But I'll tell you this. When we think about Jesus and we think about what he did for us on that cross and we think about the scars that Jesus carries, the scars in his feet, the scars in his hands, the scars in his side from the, the sword, the spear, the, the scars on his head from when the crown of thorns was crushed into his scalp. When we think about the scars that he carries from the trial and the beatings and the torture, I wouldn't have salvation if it were not for Jesus' scars. It's Jesus' scars that give me life. It's Jesus' scars that give you life. And the reality, is, the reality is his scars are beautiful because they give us life. And that's why the cross is so powerful. And that's why we preach it every week to the unbeliever, yes, but also to the believer. Because as I blend my scars with his, because I am in Christ and he is in me, as I take those scars that I have and I blend them with Christ, I too will be able to say these scars are powerful. And your scars can actually provide life for other people. Not that there's salvation in you, but because you've blended your scars with Jesus Christ, and now your scars can point to the scars of a Savior. And scars can provide life for other people. Colossians 2.7 says, Let your roots grow down into Him, and let your lives be built on Him. 
Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. One more choice that we can make today, and I set this one apart because it's really the ultimate choice that we have to each one of us make as more than conquerors, and that is decide today that nothing can destroy you. Decide today that nothing can destroy you. You can make a decision that you will not let anything destroy you. You can declare it. You can say, God, I'm telling you right now, no matter what comes my way, I will grieve, I will mourn, I'll be devastated by the losses that have come and are yet to come, but I will not let them destroy me. This problem, this pain, this agony, it's not going to win. And if you're a person of resilience, of perseverance, of character, and you're going to rebuild hope again, you too will have to make, even if it's a feeble declaration, a declaration just the same that says, no matter what comes, God will get me through it. And in Christ, I will not let it destroy me. It's already stolen from me. It's already wounded me. But it cannot take me. And I invite you to make this declaration, to make this declaration from Psalm 118, 17. This is one of my life verses. I invite you to make it one of yours. It says, I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. Would you read that with me? I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. Pull your outline back out. Look at that first, those first verses on your outline, Romans 8. Let's read this again through the context of what we've been talking about. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Well, Satan's ultimate goal. What's the enemy's ultimate goal for your life? It's to separate you from God. To separate you from God. You have a relationship with God, you trust in him, you believe in him, but then there's this trouble, this pain, this trauma, and over time the temptation is to take a step back from God. To say, God, you're not who I thought you were. God, how can I trust you if you'd let this happen to me? And if that's your response, and if it stays your response, the enemy has won. The trouble has won. The pain has won. The scar has won when you've allowed it to separate you from God. And God's word says you're a conqueror when you say, yes, this hurts. Yes, this has taken me to my face time and time again. But I will not be separated from the love of God that I have found through Christ Jesus. That makes you a conqueror. Here's even the better part. What does Paul mean when he says you are more than a conqueror? He uses that phrase more than a conqueror. How do you become more than a conqueror? Like you either conquer something or you don't. How are you more than a conqueror? To become more than a conqueror is to take the very thing that was meant to destroy you, the very thing that was meant to separate you from God, and you make that thing serve you. When you take those wounds... When you take the suffering and the scars and the loss and what has been stolen from you, when you take the very thing that was meant to kill you, meant to destroy you, meant to wipe you out, meant to discourage you, meant to separate you from God, and you say, this thing now serves me and it serves me to become more like Christ. Because the hard times that we go through can make us more like Christ. Suffering can produce hope. And we have an opportunity to say, not only do I conquer this thing, but it serves me now. And it's not separating me from God. It's drawing me closer to God. Hold on. Yes, you can. Through the power of Jesus Christ, you can still stand. You can still say, I'm still here. I will not die. I will live to tell what the Lord has done. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for allowing 
yourself to be wounded on my behalf. Thank you that it's your scars that have brought me life. And Father, as we collectively think of the wounds in our own lives, as we think of the ways that the enemy attempts to take us down, I thank you for Jesus, who is our model, who is our guide. Even more than that, he is our savior. And God, I pray that you would use each of us to hold each other up, that when we think we can't do it, or when we think we can do it on our own, that you would use us, wounded healers in each other's lives. May we live in our community as people that have scars but are willing to let those scars bring life to others. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you need to make a de- that declaration today, if you say, I want in on this declaration, I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm deciding today, today before I leave here, that nothing can destroy me. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to lift up your hand. And that's not, it's just a symbol, no, no one's going to come to your seat or anything like that. It's just, you, you, maybe you want to make a move today that, that demonstrates that I'm in on this decision. I'm drawing this line in the sand today. I'm choosing today that nothing can destroy me. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand right now? Yes, way to go, way to go. Lift it up, lift it up high. And just say this verse after me. Make it your declaration. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. God, thank you. Thank you for helping us find hope again. Thank you that in Christ, we can handle anything. And thank you for the power of the cross and the power of your scars. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.